from the Hebrew University at Jerusalem, the famous center for the study of rationality, and the writer of this classic that is destined to be uh, very, very well known. It's already very well known. It's called Insight into Game Theory. It's a great way to learn uh, about game theory uh, for all people of all backgrounds. And myself, I learned it was the most painless way to learn game theory. Uh, and it's a little bit dirty because when I hit breakfast, I read it. <laughs> so, but that's how I learned game theory, although it's not my specialty. Uh, so, uh, any other talk about this book uh, in this talk. Also, as usual, you're welcome to join us for dinner uh, at the Evelyn Restaurant 645, but I need to know if, uh, whether you can come immediately after the talk. Let me know. Thank you. Okay, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm very happy to few words before I'm starting to show some of the slides. I came into writing this book, not, uh, I'm not a proper game theorist, but I was a teacher of mathematics in, in the high school and then I went to, I, I was doing some kind of my PhD in uh, mathematics teaching and I was really aware of the really problematic situation about teaching mathematics, you know, for kids, not for the right one, but you know, from those who are, you know, the medium or even less. And I, I, I myself took some courses in game theory in my bachelor uh, with Professor Arman. And once he gave a kind of a semi-popular lecture in the Hebrew University, and then it hits me that I can find few topics in game theory and trying to write them in a way that high school student will, uh, will be well with it, you know. Uh, presenting it mostly in a natural language. It, as minimum as I could, I used formulas or, uh, you know, the, the, the main the main language that we are used to in mathematics. And the, the uh, process was, you know, that I was looking for topics, and then I have a group of kids. Uh, I was testing it with them. If, if you can do it, to what depths you can do it, uh, how you can do it, what exercises you can do. And the, the kids were high school kids. Of course, most of them chose it, you know, they were quite bright kids, but you know, some of them were very young. I started, it was a kind of a small group in the university, they were 14, 15, and then I tested it in high school too. And uh, slowly, but surely, you know, it came out that I, I can make a book with, uh, which is, um, consists of uh, four uh, chapters, four topics, that are not connected to each other uh, mathematically. So you can take just one chapter and look at it and study it, and that's it. If the classroom is allowing it or whatever. And if you can, you can do uh, some more. So the, in the, through my PhD thesis, I have uh, four topics that one of them, we thought, maybe I can say I thought and Oman thought, but Mashler said it will not win, uh, go through. It was a topic about, uh, uh, there is a theorem about the chess game, uh, which the proof of it is, is very, very abstract. And uh, I thought, because it's not formally, it's, it uses uh, mathematical induction, but still you can do it verbally. And I thought that it will go, and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, I was teaching it, and you know the... You mean, is it the, the mellow thing that you can always... That there the is an always, uh, that there is a strategy, either yeah. the... Uh, yeah. the black can uh, oppose on the white, or the white on the black, or either a tick. Uh, it's very abstract. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's easy, but abstract. And I, I was teaching it, and then someone, and all of them said, so what's, what's going on here? So for sure, that's what's happening. <laughs> they didn't realize that the theorem was talking about 
that there is a strategy that, you know, oppose, uh, you know, uh, something on it. So, and then I changed, the, I, I changed it and I, I, t I took it out. And when we finished, when I finished my PhD in the Department of Science Teaching, they, someone uh, came to us, to Mashler and me, and offered that we will write a book that maybe will go into the system. Maybe. Well, it, it, it wasn't. But, uh, so we, we started it. We, I wrote it in Hebrew. And uh, I made few experiments with high school kids, and you know, even uh, a quite good one, and not the, the, be the best one, and it didn't work, so I left it, and that's it. And then Oman came and said, let's try to translate it into English. Maybe it will, it will work outside, even to college kids, you know, who are not mathematical majoring, but are taking economics or uh, MBAs or whatever, and they need the kind of, uh, you know, um, being uh, acquainted with game theory. So, and that's it. So Cambridge University Press uh, took a uh, uh, take it, and, and the, the, this is the book. Now the book is, uh, consists of uh, four topics. The first topic, we called it uh, mathematical matching, which is based on the Gale Shapley algorithm uh, of uh, um, it's, uh, there was a, the Gale Shapley algorithm was uh, I'll show you exactly. I'm skipping all this. Uh, what's, uh, here it is. In in '62. Uh, David Gale and Lloyd Chapley, they wrote a paper, The College Admission and Stability of Marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, as it said, it's raised eyebrows at, at run the corporation. Uh, and uh, later on, David Gale wrote a paper that the, the whole issue uh, came out after reading an article in the 60s in the New Yorker about the whole situation of a uh, problematic situation about admission at Yale University, which is not just Yale. It's usually a problematic way, you know, that students are uh, addressing uh, several uh, universities, several colleges. They don't know, the university doesn't know how they are scared for the student. The student doesn't know how he's scared for the university. So it came out that it's a, you know, a kind of a guess game, more or less. So they decided to try to make a kind of an algorithm that will, maybe will give some answer to uh, this uh, problem. And they, they started with a very artificial situation which said that we have N students with N universities, which is not very, you know, really realistic, but still they, they needed it in order to make the algorithm. That's the reason that they gave it the marriage problem and stuff like this, because it's, uh, they started all the all uh, presenting the uh, problems uh, in a, a round of po uh, um, about proposing uh, between men and women. So uh, I, I started in the book with a with a kind of uh, an example that uh, consider you have a community of men and women where the number of men and, equal, uh, and women are equal. And it's just on the first example, we took, you know, the real names, you know, because uh, I, I present in a little a few words the, uh, the proof of, this, of the theorem, 
that it makes it quite uh, heavy if you are going with names along the whole way. But for the first example, we decided that it will make be, it will be easier, you know, to do uh, something that is more more or less uh, real. So we took four uh, boys and four girls, and um, this is uh, the table shows uh, their preferences uh, for each, you know, for the other six. Now, in the book here, I put it in a table which is uh, two-dimensional in the book, because of the, it's for two students, we made it two parallel tables for the men and for the women instead of, because I saw that even, I, sh we, I was talking about it uh, at the Quran and people were asking what are the numbers. So the numbers are, the left number is uh, the preference of the guy and the right uh, is the preference of the woman. So means if I'm uh, looking on the first row, L prefers on the first place share, on the second dot, on the third an, and on the fourth space. And if you are looking at the column, let's say dot, she prefers on the first place cal, on the second an, on the third bob, and on the fourth uh, dan. Okay, so this is their... Uh, uh, Preference. Now there is a kind of um, a kind of a supposition that there is no indifference. So it's indifference is not allowed, and you cannot say, "Well, uh, I'm staying alone, but none of those guys I'm, I'm going with." To. So everyone, for the algorithm at the beginning, everyone has to say to rank, you know, to give a scale with a, 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 um, an order uh, of all of the guys. And the, all of the guys have to give a scale of all the girls. Then, later on, after we prove the theorem, uh, we can see that we can take the suppositions away and it can be even not a, a equal uh, a number of men and women and there can be also indifference and there it can be that someone will say I'm staying alone but none of them mm -hmm. or I'm just I'm going just with Al if not with him none of them mm -hmm. so and you know what's what came out what, uh, what it was really interesting in it, that it's, um, in a way, it's very surprising that in every preference structures, structures that, uh, that you are taking, there is a stable matching. Now, what is a stable matching? I started again in the book, we showed some matching. And again, the numbers here is that the left one is of the guys, the right one of the girls. And you, we, you know, we ask it if it's a good matching. A good matching means that no one will break it. So every no, there is no couple that prefer someone else on of the uh, of the one that he is matched with, and the other guy wants him too. So this one is not a stable matching. Because if you look again, uh, again uh, in the, on the table, I think that here I wrote to myself that um, the share, share and Al, share and Al, you see share got her fourth uh, preference and Al got his second. And if I'm going back to the table, Al, Al prefers Cher on the first, and he got the second. And uh, Cher got, uh, she prefers Al on the third, and she got the fourth. So they can break the, break the matching. So we, uh, in the book, again, we, we found that uh, this can be break. Uh, you know, they can break the, the matching. Now, we offered another one that all the guys, but it cannot be all of them, 
three of them got their first web preference, and the, this is the other one. Mm -hmm. But because of this specific situation, it, it, they, no one can break it. So no, no one, because she, uh, if Beth is trying to ask Al or Bob or, uh, uh, or uh, Cal, no one will go with her because they got their first preference. On the other hand, if we are looking on situation where uh, the girls are getting the uh, first preference, here it can be great. So, uh, uh, so the point is that we are, we are uh, waiting for a kind of a stable matching. We are looking for a matching system that will be such that under it there cannot be found a man and a woman who are not paired off with each of other, uh, but prefer each other to their actual mates. And there is a formal, uh, formal uh, definition, what is a stable matching? Now what is really, uh, you know, surprising, that's what, that's what I say, that, that there is, the theorem says that no matter which preference structure you take, even if you take that all the guys are giving the same scale of preference and the, sa and the women are giving the same, there will be a stable matching, always. Not, uh, we are not sure about if it will be one, we don't know exactly to say there is an, oh, it's, it's not known if there is, there is a situation when we can prove that it's only one, and I'll talk about in a minute. So the, the proof of the, of the theorem goes like this, and I'm always, in, when I'm teaching it, I'm always talking to the girls mm -hmm. that it's the best thing to be active, because when you are active, so you, you are get the, uh, the, better, uh, the better situation. So the situation is like this. Let's say that the uh, men are proposing, and the women are sitting in a room, and the, the, the men are coming. Now, everyone is going to his first preference. If there is a, if there is a woman that she got nothing on the first stage, okay, she's, she's sitting there and waiting. If someone gets just one offer, she says, okay, I'm not sure I want you, but in the meantime, we will be friends. <laughs> so we are, we are on, you are on my waiting list, yeah? <laughs> if someone got more than one offer, so she's, you know, she's choosing the best for her and rejected, uh, rejecting the other ones. So then the, in the second, uh, the second stage, those who were rejected are going to the second uh, of a uh, second person on the scale. Now, again, no, uh, remember the situation is because of the algorithm, no one can be indifferent and no one can say that I'm staying alone or whatever. So it's end-to-end -end matching. So the same happened on the second stage and uh, if someone is coming new for, to me and I have someone, but I prefer him, so I'm saying to the one with me, bye-bye, it was nice to meet you, but I prefer this guy and he's going away. And so it, it goes on and on till the end. The end is a stable matching. Because, and you can, you can see if there are, let's say if someone got his 17th preference, and you say, well, it's, it's, it's in my list, but it's my 17th preference. <laughs> but if, he's, if, if he is with a 17th preference, means that when he was offering, he was rejected. So no one, he, he cannot say anything to someone on the list. And the same if there, if there is a woman that she's stuck with someone of the 17th preference means that no one on the list want her better. So on the, at the end, the, the situation is it's a stable matching. 
So that's now you can do. That's what I am saying that to the girls be active because it's symmetric. If the if the women are proposing and the men are sitting, it will be stable too, and to the benefit of the of the women. Now, there is a situation, and we are approving it through the first chapter, that if when the men are proposing, we get a stable matching, and the same we get when the women are proposing, it's the only one match, uh, stable matching for the whole uh, structure. So, uh, but it can be, and we have some examples that when the men are proposing, we get one matching, which is stable. When the women are, is, are proposing, we get another one. And at least we have one uh, example that there is one more that is, it's, not com it's not coming out in the, in the algorithm. But the situation is we are defining a kind of optimality that you get the optimum in the, in the while the, the proposition, the, in, in the process of proposing. So the end of it for sure will be stable. So, it, and, and it comes out that it's an optimum for the active side. Now, I, I was asked and then I will say it in advance that it, uh, someone, I gave it this uh, uh, lectures uh, this week, asked what's going on if we have, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the same sex of couples. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It has to be uh, women versus men, uh, universities versus students, you know, job, jobs local through uh, uh, positions or whatever, it's, uh, it has been a clear cut and we are giving, following Gail and Shapley, there is a very known counter, counter example uh, about, uh, you know, uh, matching of uh, uh, roommates in somewhere, in a camp or whatever, and we, the example is that there are four guys and three of them are ranking on the fourth uh, scale, on the fourth place, the same guy. So when, which one, anyone who is with him will go, will break the matching. So there is no stable matching in this situation. It can be, but it will not be always. Now in the, in the chapter, in the same chapter, we are going from the N to N, and then we are generalizing it to the situation that it will be always a stable matching if, there, if it's not M to M, if it's N and M, either it's, it's not equal, and if, if it's an indifference, uh, and also if someone says, I would like just one on the, on the, play, uh, on the list, and if not with him, I'm alone. So maybe he will be, he will be with no one, but it will be stable because he, he has no, no one to break the match that, uh, that wants him. So whatever we are doing it, if, if we are following the situation of the proposing, uh, there will be always a stable matching. Now the same goes when we are going to the uh, situation of uh, matching universities and students. And then it's not one-to-one, -one, so then we are taking kind of the <coughs> university has a quota. So we are looking at the quota, and we are taking, you know, some examples, you know, let's say University A, B, and C, and we say the quota is three, the quota is five, so that we can do it, you know, in a way. And according to the same uh, proposition, uh, proposals, uh, you see, the students are uh, addressing the universities, you, the universities, if it is on, on the list of preference and it's under the quota, he is there. If he's, it's more than the quota, she's, the <coughs> university is rejecting, reject, rejecting those who she doesn't want to or she, she wants, you know, less. 
And uh, again, on the, at the end of it, the situation is that the matching is stable. Even it can be that there are some students that will be in no university. It will not be university that has no one, but it can be that there will be a university under the quota. Now, what was really surprising that I think they didn't know anything about it, but in the, I, I decided to myself in the book, I wrote it, it happened to be that the Association of the American Medical Colleges had already for 10 years before uh, Gale and Chapley uh, applying the Gale Chapley algorithm to the task of assigning internments to the hospitals in the United States. And they are still doing it on the same algorithm, but on the benefit of the university, of the hospitals, not for the uh, stu mm -hmm. medical students. So, so it, it happened to be that they didn't know that they are doing a, a Gail Shapley algorithm, <laughs> but they were doing it. So, so the whole, uh, you know, the whole uh, chapter is you know, it's something very, you know, close, and you can teach it just this one. And I'm going to the second one. The second one uh, is dealing with uh, social justice, uh, which is uh, uh, the problem of uh, probably you, you know the situation of um, the Condorcet paradox. You know, you know, you heard about it. That if you have, a, I think I, I, I can write it here to see students, I'll make it shorter in a way with X and Y and Z, and then you will sit and go to myself here somewhere. I will not make it. If you have. And the issues are X and Y and Z. And this is a, a pre order of preference of the first one. This is for the other one. And this is for the third one. And if you are voting pairwise, you can see that X is preferred on Y, according to majority. And Y is preferred on Z. But Z is preferred on X. So it came out that X is preferred, is better than X. So we cannot uh, come uh, to a kind of a conclusion. You, you get that X is preferred on Y, preferred on Z, that preferred on X. So we started the, again with something that will look more familiar for the student with a story. We, the story was that we have considered the following example. A certain amount of, of municipal budget is unspent and the city council must decide how to invest it. It has three options, investment in education, in security, or in health. The sum is too small to divide it feasibly among the three options. And we have in the council three parties, left party with three members, four members, and five members. And these are their preference. So the first one is, you can see it's, it's the same as here, as over security over education, education over else over security, and security over education over else. And then, well, it can be said that uh, we will go with the majority. The, uh, the right uh, has five members, so they want to prefer security, then we will do it. But it doesn't go like this because the other two, they together will, uh, will say that they prefer health on security. So this is the kind of 
you have to say that we have to vote uh, uh, pairwise, not, uh, not on the all issues together. So when they are starting to, to do it, if you are looking at it, so security versus education, the majority is fa 